just in case. All right, so a uniform cylinder of mass M with the radius R has a string wrapped around it. The string is held fixed. Now where, they don't really tell us, but they say the cylinder is gonna fall vertically as shown. And they don't say it yet, but if you fast forward, it's gonna accelerate, it's going to fall down. Now it's not in free fall, but it's gonna fall down. Can we be nice to ourselves and say that's the positive direction? I don't know, is that nice to go against the standard? I mean, at the end of the day, pick something, right? If they don't specify positive negative direction, pick a method and go with it. And so I'm gonna go with that forward is positive mentality. And so, like I said, it's gonna be held fixed at this top of the string. So if you've ever done a yo-yo before, you're gonna hold the string, let it fall down. Now, yes, it comes up and you do tricks with it. Ignore that part, just a simple descent. Show, prove, demonstrate that the acceleration of the cylinder downward is 2g over three. So this is the answer in the back of the book. We're not gonna work backwards. I'm not gonna use this to solve for other things, but this is prove that the acceleration is this. So we wanna solve for acceleration. Well, hopefully when this is asked, you think, oh, I need a net force. Oh, but wait, I gotta draw a force diagram. It all starts with that force diagram. And so I'm gonna put it on the picture. They show tension upward. And so I'm gonna make that just a little bigger. FT or T. Now notice they showed the tension at that last point of contact, okay? That tangent point on the disc. Now real yo-yos I think have an even smaller, it goes a smaller radius inside, right? The radius, you have a lot of string wrapped around that spool. And so spoil, spool. I feel like I'm saying it wrong. Y'all say it. Spool, that sounds right, it sounds weird. Okay, okay. What other force is acting on this cylinder? Of course, gravity. Where do we draw gravitational forces? From the center of mass. And so I, I'm gonna put a dot here, label for self, okay? And the gravitational force, wait, is it the same size as tension? How big should I draw this gravitational force? Bigger, why bigger? Not just because it's falling down, but it's going to accelerate down, right? You, in, in big picture, it's not about just the two forces and direction, but it's about their magnitudes, okay? So you can move with a constant velocity and have balanced forces. But here, we know that the weight or mg is gonna be the driving force. It's gonna be bigger than the tension so that we can have a net force in the downward direction. Any other forces? No, it's gravity and anything touching. There's just a string touching it, okay? The person who's holding, they're not touching the disc, they're just touching the string. And so we come back over here, we got our diagram. Now it's time for a net force. And so Newton's second law, F net equals MA. And I'm gonna go with down as positive. So I'll say MG minus that tension. Now we're trying to solve for acceleration and notice we don't really have numbers. M, R, acceleration, pretend you don't know that, we're trying to solve for it. And so we don't have numbers per se, but do I want tension? in my final answer, that doesn't match. And do I want mass in my final answer? The answer in the back of the book or given to us does not have mass. So I gotta keep doing stuff here. Remember, if mass is not in the final answer, that's because it's, it's not zero, it's because it probably does what? Cancels out. And so we wanna plug another equation in. 
Well, here again, go back to foundation physics. What else is happening? Yes, it's falling, but probably in this unit, it's rotating, right? Okay. And so let's do a net torque statement. Net torque equals I alpha. Remember that's Newton's second law for rotating objects. And then we need to sum the torques. Well, I actually haven't even decided what force causes what torque. Now here's where we gotta do a little strategy. I want tension above to cancel out. So I want tension in this next statement, right? So that I can maybe do some kind of substitution canceling. And so let's look at it as if tension does torque. Now I'm not done with that one, I'll come back. Where do I have to put the fulcrum strategically for tension to provide torque? Where? At the string where it, right there? Where the string touches the cylinder? I can't put it here because tension would pass through the fulcrum and have no lever arm, right? And so I wanna put it somewhere away from the tension force. At where? At the bottom? So actually we can't put it here and let me get a little nitty gritty for you, okay? So as you read your book, hint, hint, wink, wink, we have a book, what? So I wanna go back to that shape constant for a second. And so a uniform cylinder, they didn't tell it to us. I've promised you, you don't have to memorize, but the inertia of this disc is one half MR squared. And it's using the full radius of it. That one half is based on it rotating about the center. And so if I take this uniform cylinder disc, I don't wanna rotate it about the edge. That would be a different shape constant. Okay, it's okay. Little dent, but it survived. And so here's what the shape constant for these round objects is commonly based on. It's rotating about what point? The center of mass, okay? So that one half, if you use it, you really need to have the fulcrum at the center, okay? Don't stress, don't stress. Okay, but you don't wanna put it at an edge cause that wouldn't be one half, okay? And so, oops, let's put it at that same location as center of mass. Samir, did you have a follow-up? Oh, okay. And so now we get to fulfill two things. So the nitty gritty about if you use one half, it needs to rotate about the center. And then here torque is able to, tension is able to provide torque. Does gravity provide torque as well? MG, why not? It goes through the hinge. So what's the lever arm? for the gravitational force. And so if it doesn't have a lever arm, it provides no torque, at least from this spot. But tension, a vertical force, does have a horizontal lever arm from the fulcrum, axis of rotation to the line of force. And so torque, if we wrap around, is gonna have a counterclockwise torque and doesn't that agree with down that we already said? So counterclockwise, yes, the standard sign convention is that counterclockwise is positive, but I'm choosing positive because this is the forward direction for this object, yes? Okay. So now let's go finish that torque statement. We gotta say tension force times the lever arm and it would be equal to the radius of the disc. If it had the inner spool, then maybe it's a smaller radius, right? But this is just a solid disc, hockey puck type. All right. And so now we have a system of equations. Does tension cancel? We said it, we need it to, but does it cancel right now? No, you can't cancel FT force and FTR torque 
And so that R, if you remember doing the pulleys from last time, R's are gonna commonly cancel, but only when we plug equations in for I and alpha. And so I, as promised, is gonna be that one half MR squared. You do not have to memorize the equation or the shape constant. And then alpha, well, even though they don't say it, we're gonna assume that it's a non-slip condition. And why are we in AP Physics 1 assuming that? Well, I think like 99% of the problems you'll encounter are gonna be non-slip, okay? When you start slipping, then we can't use the nice V equals omega R or A equals alpha R. These are your non-slip equations, okay? And later, after the test, we'll start getting into work and energy with ro rotating objects. And when you slip, you have heat losses. There's energy losses, okay? So it makes the math a little trickier. And so solve that second non-slip equation for alpha, plug in A over R, pause right there. What do we notice? One set of R's does cancel at that point. And then I'm gonna keep my torque statement going with FTR. Stop right there. What do you notice happens? The other set of R's cancels as well. Numerator on both sides. Now it looks a little messy, so I'm gonna rewrite. And I, I don't know if this gets an official name. I don't wanna call it a force statement but I'm gonna write my simplified torque statement, okay? My modified torque statement. After all, those radii cancel. And so what's left is one half MA equals FT. So now our force equation is still useful. And now I have this equation that's useful. And so now I could stack them, do the left and right side, just like we did in our system of equations previous, or when I see FT equals something, can't I just plug this in for the tension force? We could have done that last time with our pulley, but it just would have been a little longer, okay? And so putting that in for tension makes tension go away and in my final statement here, what do we notice? M's cancel. And you're like, but is it M1, M2? I only have one mass. And so no subscript needed if it's just one mass. But you can divide the whole thing by M, it cancels out. And so we're trying to solve for A, it's in two places. So maybe we put them together. And so I'm gonna add the one half A to the other side. And so I get, let's see, two halves plus one half, I'm gonna stay fraction, three halves A equals G. And so what would the acceleration equal? I gotta multiply both sides by two thirds. And so there's the acceleration. Does it match what they said we should get? Yeah. 2G over three, same, same. And so good. Now, if this was on the AP exam, do you think they're gonna give you points for the final answer when they told you the final answer? No, they're grading your work for sure, okay? Even if they didn't tell us the final answer, most of the points come from the physics, not the math, okay? So keep that in mind. The more physics you show, have I shown physics? a net force statement, a net torque statement, substitution of non-slip. I've demonstrated those ideas, those concepts of physics. That's probably where your points are. Okay, now, easy, what's the tension? Don't use an equation after it canceled out, so use one of the equations with tension. Do y'all wanna do force or do you wanna use the torque statement? torque. And I'm going to go ahead and use the modified torque because ours are going to, if I started with the original torque, ours will still cancel and it's going to get me here. And so the tension force is equal to one half mass variable 
times the acceleration, which we now know is two thirds G. Now don't leave it like that. Even AP says you're smart enough to two divided by two is, all right, so final answer. Tension is one third of MG. Tension is one third the weight of the object. What if tomorrow they substitute this solid cylinder with a hollow cylinder or a sphere or a thin hoop? Is it always gonna be a third of the weight? No, part of that fraction came from the shape constant. Okay, so you'd have to probably go back to that uh, purple combined statement and put in a new shape constant, okay? Again, you don't have to memorize those. Questions on this yo-yo type of example. Okay, so now let's keep going. I think page 18, yes, I'm skipping some pages. So uh, the next few pages had rolling examples. Uh, we decided that timing, we're gonna do rolling after the exam. So it's not gonna be on exam one, it'll appear with probably exam two, okay? So we'll save those pages and do rolling. It has a close connection to energy, okay? If we can give explanation for torque and energy, hopefully that helps make more sense. And so let's take a look on page 18. We got another pulley, another pulley system. Does it look identical to the ones we've already done? No, we got to modify that wood. We're going to take one of the blocks and put it on a tabletop. Well, thank you very much. They tell us it's frictionless surface. So I'll ask a question here in a second, but always be ready. Tomorrow, part C maybe, they could say now the surface has friction. How does it change, right? Okay, so M1 is three kilograms. M2 hanging off the side is nine kilograms. The pulley is a uniform disc cylinder. There's that one half MR squared. You do not have to memorize. And it has a mass of six and a radius of 0.25 meter. By the way, beware, sometimes they'll tell you 25 centimeters and you have to convert, right? So be ready to convert. One, for each of the masses in the pulley, write your F net statement, your Newton second law. But wait, before we write our F net statement, what's always a good idea? Force diagram. And so let's go back to the blocks. Now, unless this was a tip or slip type of scenario, which if you're like, what's tip and slip? Did I tip a water bottle for you? Okay, so horizontal forces can tip something, careful, okay? We're just not gonna test on that. I did put up some ancillary videos if you're curious, okay? Part of your May exam prep. I mean, if anything, it's just another application of equilibrium. It's a last moment of equilibrium. But assuming it doesn't, it's just gonna slide, right? And so the box M1 has gravitational force down. I'm gonna go straight for M1G. I know I like FG, but it's important that you see the variety because AP may actually give you problems and they'll say, say something about MG. That is your gravitational force. What other forces are acting on the tabletop block? FN, there's a foot surface. It's gonna support that weight by pushing up. How big? Right, it's the same as this M1G. And so try to make it symmetrical, right? And so FN, so just note to self, FN here is equal to M1G. So they're equal and opposite, Newton's. First law, good. I was expecting the third law. In fact, last period I was talking so quickly, I said third law and then I was like, wait a second, Drake says no right? Don't worry, you'll see some action reaction pairs upcoming, but these two are equal and opposite. They're balancing on one. That balance is Newton's first law. What other force is acting on this block? 
tension, pulling it to the right. And so we don't really know how big to draw that one yet. So it's not necessarily equal to the other two. So we'll just say FT or capital T is also accepted. No friction, nothing else touching. So that's it. Everyone good? All right, M2 is the hanging mass. It's not on the table and it has a much bigger mass. So maybe we go a little more extreme, right? And so FG or I can go M2G. And what other force is acting on this mass? Tension and it's gonna pull upward. It's parallel with the string. How big do I draw it? Smaller than M2G, that is correct. Is it equal to the red tension? Not anymore, because the pulley has mass. The pulley is gonna rotate. It's gonna take more tension in this first leading T2 is what I'm gonna call it. It's gotta be bigger so that not only is it responsible for pulling block one, but it's responsible for pulling on the pulley. Okay, later we'll talk about energy, but it's doing work on the pulley. And so this tension force, not as big as M2, but now I need some subscript so we can keep things straight, right? And so note to self, FT2 is not equal to FT1. FT2 is greater than T1 or T1 is less, however you wanna read that. But FT2 is greater than M2G. And that's just for your knowledge. You don't have to put that stuff on a force diagram, but it's the things we think about when drawing. Yes. Oh, not greater, less than. Thank you. Okay. I was just seeing who was paying attention. Yes. Oh, I meant do not equal. There we go. See, there you go. Yeah, I think I said do not equal, but put a slash. Now, is it good? Who's paying attention? What now? Oh, you're paying attention. You're, you're saying yes. I thought well, there was another mistake. Okay. Okay. So now we know tension two, bigger than tension one. No other force is acting on M2. And so now the last thing to draw a diagram for, and yes, we do draw them for pulleys when they have mass, when they rotate, because that's how we figure out who has torque. Now I'm not gonna try and squeeze it on that little bitty circle. So let's zoom in, or I'm gonna draw the pulley a little bit bigger. And hopefully you know that it's connected to some kind of fixed point, okay? And so that fixed point or our pivot point is gonna be right here in the center. Well, it has mass. So from the center of mass, also the center, we can draw the FG. And actually this one is probably in between magnitude because if you look, they gave us three nine and the pulley is six. What other forces are acting on the pulley? We got tension, I'm gonna save it. Isn't there some kind of support force from the rod that it's on connected to? So the whole thing doesn't come crashing down, right? Something's lifting it up. And so whether you wanna call it a pivot or a hinge or just a good old normal force, right? There's a support force. So it's gonna go up. We don't want the pulley to fall down. And so it's gonna go up. How big do I draw it? Bigger than capital MG? Why? No. So earlier, I said that the normal force on block one was supporting block one. Does block two have its own normal force to support the weight? No. And so when you look at the right side of the situation, that pivot is supporting the pulley and M2. And so I'm gonna draw that 
FN bigger than capital MG, okay? And just note to self that this one is balancing capital MG and M2G. So it's supporting both of those weights. There's no tabletop for either. Now, are either of these forces gonna do torque? Do they have a lever arm? No, they both pass through the pivot point, the axis of rotation, the fulcrum. And so no torque on these two. And so now let's think about other forces that do cause rotation. Well, what are they? What other forces are acting on the disc? Tension, which one? Both. And so look at those initial and final contacts where the string leaves and starts on your disc, okay? So it's at the top, which is gonna be the 12 o'clock position, if you will. And then on the right side, which is the three o'clock position. And so T1 is pulling to the left because it pulls parallel to the string. And so it's pulling to the left on the disc. And notice FT1 on box one pulled to the right. And so these are your equal and opposite action reaction pairs. And Drake would be happy because they're on two different objects, right? They're not playing the balancing game. They're playing the, we are internal forces when you take a system approach. So we're gonna cancel out. And the only way to do that is if they're equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. Good deal? All right. One more force, T2 pulls what direction on the pulley? At least the right side of the pulley. It pulls down parallel to the string. They always pull parallel to the string. And so, and I wanna draw it as big as the other one because guess what? Here's another action reaction pair. Newton's third law again. Those are two separate action reaction pairs. Okay. Now, how do we know they provide torque? Well, identify your lever arm. And so thankfully, this pulley is a circular object. And so the lever arm from the edge where the rope is to the fulcrum, our lever arm for each is gonna be equal to radius. FT1 is horizontal, it gets a vertical lever arm. FT2 is a vertical force, it gets a horizontal lever arm. Now let's talk about direction. I haven't mentioned direction for anybody, but when we release this system from rest, maybe we've propped up M2, we release it from rest. What direction's everybody going? M2's going down. Come on, y'all, pay attention. Test next class. M2's going down, so I'm gonna call that positive forward. Block one is gonna go to the right. So I'm gonna call to the right positive. What about the pulley? It has to kind of flow with those. And so clockwise or counterclockwise for this problem is our forward positive direction. They have the same lever arm, but FT2 is bigger. It's gonna have a bigger torque. And so that clockwise is gonna be what I'm gonna call the positive. It's not the standard, but just think forward positive, forward positive. And if you think about it in a simulation type, isn't it all gonna to flow together that same direction? Right, down, and clockwise, okay? Okay, so that's a lot, that's a lot, right? F net statements. We'll go back to block one. Now the vertical, it's not moving vertically. Block one is not, right? We've already said the weight balances the normal force. And so I'm not gonna rehash the vertical statement for block one. And so we're just gonna keep with forward direction. 
And so for block one, I'm just gonna focus on the X direction. And there's only one horizontal force, it's tension one. Block two, F net for block two. And it's only in the vertical, it only has one. So again, forward, it'd be M2A equals, and we have M2G minus FT2. Tensions do not cancel. Those are not the same tension. And so really we need the net torque statement for the pulley. Again, this should feel familiar. Now, before I you know, start stacking them, I'm gonna come over to the right and do my substitution, cancel the Rs, and then I'll put my simplified under the stack, okay? And so net torque for the pulley is equal to I alpha. Who's doing positive torque? I just personally like to start with the positive. Which force is contributing positive torque? Two, so to FT2 times its lever arm, R, minus the opposite, who's pulling back the other counterclockwise direction? FT1 times its lever arm. Thankfully, they're on the same disc. Later, we'll do one where there's an inner and outer radius. Okay, again, the yo yo, you may have that inner spool. Okay. And so now, even if I were to stack them, very little is gonna be productive. So let's start plugging in. Inertia, they said, is one half MR squared. Remember the one half is that K value. Alpha, now they may not have said it's non-slip, but again, non-slip, 99% of the time. So A equals alpha R. And so here, solve for alpha, I can plug in A over R. Pause, what happens? One set of R's cancels on the left. And if we keep going with our torques, now every term, we have three terms here, has an R value. And so divide the whole equation by radius. And there, there's only one radius. So it all cancels out. And so what's left? And so that's what I'm gonna write under the other two. That's what we can system approach. And so I get one half big M times A equals FT2 minus FT1. And again, just as a reminder that a K value is the one half. And so now we're all stacked. That's really the end of part one. Part two says, what's the acceleration? Well, let's keep variables going. Let's solve for the acceleration. And so taking a system approach, what do we know about all these accelerations? They're all the same. And so it's a system acceleration, right? So we can kind of factor it out from all three and add the masses. And so M1 plus M2 plus Km, or if you want to switch it to the one half, okay? I just don't want you forgetting, it's not a random one half, it's the K, it's based on K. All right, what happens on the right-hand side? Now my Newton's third law action-reaction pairs, I've got two T1s, positive and negative, and two T2s, positive and negative. Notice this one is not a difference in the weights. It's just based on the hanging mass weight. Okay, that's the driving force for it all. And so to solve for acceleration, it would be that hanging mass weight divided by the sum of the masses, not ignoring the shape constant. Don't ignore the shape constant. This is the part where students forget. They just so are used to system mass, system mass, system mass. 
and they add up all the masses and then they get it wrong. And so now let's go back to plugging in numbers. So M2 up above, they said was nine. Gravity, I'm gonna use 10. M1 was three kilograms plus nine. By the way, does the nine cancel out? No. And here comes that shape constant again, the one half. And then the mass of the pulley disc, they said is six. And so half of six is three plus three plus nine. We get a denominator 15. And 90 over 15 is six. Unit, everybody was SI unit. And so it should come out linear acceleration SI unit, which is meters per second squared, okay? All right, the hard part's over, the long part's over. Now it's just plug and chug, okay? And don't expect a lot of plug and chug. We, you know, we, we take comfort in getting the right numerical answer, right? Think about answers in the back of the book. And so, yes, be comfortable with the math, but the, the setup is the most important part. Okay. What is the angular acceleration? Well, again, assuming non-slip, safe assumption for AP Physics 1, A is equal to alpha times R. So alpha, we subbed it in last time, but now we're actually solving for it. So six divided by, now the radius canceled earlier, so I haven't had to use it yet, but I go back up and they say, 0.25 meters. And so I have meters per second squared divided by meters. Meters is actually going to cancel. And so six divided by one fourth, 24. What's our SI unit for angular acceleration? Radians per second squared. And so remember radians kind of appears because we had nothing left in the numerator, right? And it relates to the rotation of a circle of a cycle. And so radians is a placeholder unit that we need. The next two questions, what's the tension in each? And so earlier we canceled it taking a system approach. Now we wanna solve for it and we can now that we know the acceleration. And so just pick one of the equations that has T1 and T2 in it. And so from M1 to solve for that tension, I'm gonna go use my original F net statement for block one. So I'm just gonna rewrite M1A equals FT1. Again, if friction were there, you'd have to subtract out friction. So make sure you get the right mass. This is why subscripts play an important role. M1 is three. The linear acceleration is six. Tension one is 18 Newtons. And now that we know T1, we have a couple choices. So for T2, we can do the force statement for block two, or we can use the torque statement. And so what do y'all wanna use? Forces or torque? Which one? I just can't hear you. One finger for force, two fingers for torque too. Okay, so we'll take a torque approach. And so you can either use, just note to self, you can use F net of two, or we can do net torque. And so we're gonna do net torque and since we know radius is gonna cancel, I'm gonna go in and use the modified version of our torque statement. And so our net torque was one half mass of pulley A equals FT2 minus FT1. So I just rewrote that modified torque statement. Now we can plug it in. Again, make sure you use the correct mass. And so shape constant, one half. Big M was the symbol for the pulley disc. 
they tell you up above it's six kilograms. Linear acceleration, also six. FT2 is what we're looking for. And now we know FT1 is 18. And so half of six is three times six is 18. Wait, does 18 cancel and we get zero? No, we got to add the right side, 18, and we get FT2 equals 36 Newtons. Now, should we read into this and say, oh, always, it should have a one to two ratio, always? Have we learned our lesson with always in physics? No. Look at the masses, three, six, and nine. Shape constant, one half, right? Those are pretty uh, nice numbers with each other, okay? So I would not assume your two tensions are always a one to two ratio. In fact, I would bet money that it's not that way. All right, number six takes us back to kinematics and it should be pretty boring at this point because, well, it's 1D kinematics. Okay, and so we'll do this real quick and then I'm gonna take it further, right? Go to the new stuff. And so what distance is traveled by M1, the one on the tabletop in five seconds? True or false? We could solve for the vertical displacement of M2 in five seconds and it'd be the same. True or false? It's true. So if they both start from rest, we've already said they have the same acceleration and then the time is the same. And so where it says M1, it could be for M2 as well, okay? But we'll just keep with the M1. So it starts at rest. We know time is five seconds, acceleration is six. And we're looking for a distance or displacement. What old kinematic equation are we gonna use? The second one. And so we get the VIT, which zeroes out, plus one half AT squared. And so half, now that's a half part of the equation. That's not shape constant. A is six, T is five, don't forget to square it. And so three times 25, what do we get? 75 meters, maybe this isn't a tabletop, maybe it's a cliff, okay? So sometimes crazy numbers, sometimes five seconds in the world of physics is really long. So let's take it further. How can we review rotational kinematics before we take an exam next class, right? So that's what we spent most of our time. What if the question said, what's the angular displacement of the pulley? And you might be thinking degrees, but we can answer this with radians. And so again, assuming non-slip, the displacement that your boxes travel, if every single turn equates to that unraveling of the rope, then it's gonna be that angular displacement times R. So again, linear quantity times angular quantity times radius or equals angular times radius. And so 75 meters equals what angular displacement and the radius was 0.25 meters. So we got to divide both sides by one fourth. It's going to be a big number. What do we get? 300. Now notice meters on the left, meters on the right. What's the unit for angular displacement? Radians. Okay. And so just so this problem wanted a linear displacement tomorrow, angular displacement, right? They're connected. Or we could have used angular kinematics, okay? But wait, we can go one step further. Another part of this, how many revolutions does this equate to? How do we find out how many revolutions, how many rotations in five seconds? Say again. Um, related, 
But if we know how many radians it turns through, one revolution or rotation has how many radians? Two pi. And so radians no longer needed. And so, I mean, you could maybe say 150 divided by pi, right? Or work it out. Let's get a whole number. Your nearest whole or half number. How many rotations? Plug and chug. Y'all like easy stuff. Huh? Okay. So almost 50, right? Almost 50. Is it really 49? Point, okay. So 47.7, about 48 rotations or revolutions. Okay. So just be ready, right? We did all that stuff early on in the unit. So a little callback. And then of course, AP questions, we got to prep you. They love to make changes. And so that's what this last question is. Now they could make a lot of changes. They could change the mass of block one. They could put friction in there. They could set, change the mass of block two. They could change the radius of the pulley. They could change the shape constant of the pulley. So what we're about to do, you'll use the same strategy, but just be careful when they make other changes, okay? What if we increase the mass of just the pulley? That's it. How does it affect our answers to the first four questions? Is it gonna increase, decrease, or stay the same? Okay, and so linear acceleration, so I'm gonna go up and down, up and down, because we did the work up above. We have equations up above. And so linear acceleration was in part two. Find where we use the pulley's mass. So the pulley's mass was in the denominator, if you see the highlighted blue, imagine that's a bigger number. Instead of six, maybe it's now eight, 10, 12. What's gonna happen if everybody else stays the same, linear acceleration will decrease. What relationship does pulley mass and acceleration have, in have? inverse? And always be ready to explain, right? So on AP, you can say that a and mass of pulley have an inverse relationship. And so we'll get a decrease in linear acceleration. Well, what about angular acceleration? We didn't really put the equation in terms of the pulley mass, but going back up, part three, we see angular acceleration. It relates to linear acceleration that we just had. What relationship do these two have? Direct. And so A and alpha have a direct relationship. And so if, a, if linear acceleration goes down, then alpha is gonna go down as well. And then the last two relate to the tensions. And so for T1, again, go back up to part four, it says. So the tension in rope one was based on the mass of block one, that's the same, and linear acceleration. What relationship does A have with FT1? Direct, oops, wrong thing. I thought I was on my highlight. And so those have a direct relationship. How's that back table going? Y'all getting focused for that exam next class? I know you're all gonna be here, right? They have a direct relationship. And so A went down, so FT1 will decrease. Now you might start getting you know, caught up in the spirit of things and say, well, decrease, decrease, decrease. Okay, don't start making assumptions. Let's see what happens with F2 or FT2, sorry. So the string, the tension in the second string, we use torque. Now I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here. And so notice our torque statement, tension two is what we're trying to find. 
We know T1 is going to decrease. We know linear acceleration is going to decrease. But the mass of the pulley increases. Well, how the crud are we supposed to know what happens? Don't use the torque statement. Let's use the force statement, OK? And so I have it written back up in part one. I'm just going to rewrite it down here. And so note to self, don't use torque. Don't use the torque equation. Let's use the second equation, OK? So M2A was based on the weight of block two minus the tension two. I'm going to solve it, isolate for T2. And so FT2 is the weight of M2 minus basically the F net of the second block. Did the, did the weight of the second block change? M2G, is that what's increasing? No, they left the hanging mass alone. So this is the same. M2 is the same, but we know that acceleration went down. And the key thing here, don't say direct relationship because this is a little different. We're gonna be subtracting a smaller F net from the same weight. So what's gonna to happen to tension two? It's gonna go up, okay? So we'll have an increase in FT2. Good deal. All right. Lots of variations of pulleys, yes? We saw side by side with no rotation, side by side with rotation. We saw, a, you know, one hanging mass. Y'all are going to try that one. And then there was the yo-yo type of application, not really a pulley pulley, but, and now we've seen a tabletop version. You know, if AP was feeling, uh, creative, or you might say mean, maybe in May. And by the way, I present this because they've done it before. It's been a while. Who knows? Couldn't they put a block on a ramp and attach a pulley system like so? Actually, the one given, I don't remember the year, they had three blocks. Yuck. Okay. And so that one, if you considered rotation, would be four net statements, okay? And ramps, oh, that angle, crazy stuff, right? Don't worry, ramps are coming, ramps are coming back, okay? Okay, so maybe May exam. I have no clue, I'm not hinting. It's just telling you what I've seen in the past, okay? Okay. All right, the last piece we're gonna do together is actually gonna be in the NIMSI section. And so the rolling ones, we'll come back to them. And so NIMSI, again, these are always good practice for exam prep. And so hopefully you saved all your old packets for the old topics. And so we'll come back to this. So this is the one we're going to end with. What do you notice? It's a small radius, big radius, right? And so it matters which rope attaches where. But the one we're gonna get started together is actually, I think on page 28, 28. We'll do one of the free response, at least get it started. And so find F3. Now it also carries over to page 29, but I don't know about timing. So I'm gonna try and get this done in like 10 minutes and then you'll have 10 minutes for multiple choice, okay? Consider a thin, wheel rim of radius R connected to its center axis by four spokes. The axis is connected in such a way to be frictionless. Yay, right? We love frictionless. And the four beads of mass M, hey, didn't we see that in our warm-up question? You got individual masses, right? And so they have individual masses. They're set one on each spoke. The beads can be moved to any position on the spoke. And so did I show you all this last class? A thin wheel, there's one spoke, but I have movable masses inside. So I can put the masses close to the center. Is that a high or low inertia? 
low. And if I move the masses to the outer region, now I've just done what? Increase the inertia, okay? Because I changed not the mass, it still has the same mass, but it's where the masses are located, okay? And I don't think you have to worry about AP, um, not with this type of setup, doing, you know, half a radius on one and a full radius on another, okay? They're gonna keep it symmetrical here. Maybe on a rod, they do it different. I, who knows, right? And then it says the beads can be fixed to any position so that the four beads are a distance R from the axis of the wheel. Where's the axis of the wheel? Where's our pivot? It's in the center. And so I'm gonna put my little rectangle here or triangle. The wheel and the spokes have much less mass than M. In other words, that outer rim, massless. The spokes themselves, yes, they're rods, but so insignificant, massless. The only mass that's gonna be rotating is the mass of the beads. Good deal? Then the student wraps a string several times around the rim and attaches the free end of the string to a, a block of mass 4M. So y'all, the one that I skipped earlier that y'all are gonna try is basically this, except this one has beads that are gonna move. So this one's harder. Okay. The student sets all four beads the same distance from the wheel. So no weird you know, dimensions that I mentioned. And then they give the wheel an initial motion a little push, initial push. For each of the two cases described below, sketch a graph, it's been a while, right? Of the angular speed of the wheel and the angular acceleration as functions of time. For this part, they specify, allow positive values of the rotational quantities to be clockwise. So even here, it's not the standard convention, but if you look at the picture, doesn't it make sense that it's gonna rotate clockwise? Down on the right would agree with clockwise, okay? But they are specifying, they will grade based on this direction. Case one, a student places the beads far from the center so what happens when they're further from the center? Is that a high or low inertia? It's a high inertia. Does that make it harder or easier to turn? Harder. And so it's gonna have, in terms of net torque being I alpha, let's kind of think about this, net torque I alpha. Think about the string, the tension is gonna move, uh, rotate the wheel. And so it's that tension times the big radius where it's connected. And so if you have a high inertia, what's gonna be true about your angular acceleration? It's gonna be smaller, okay? So we get some ideas there just from where the mass is located. And then they're gonna give the wheel an initial clockwise, hey, that's the positive direction, angular speed in the beginning. They just told us we have an initial positive angular velocity, speed. Label both graphs for this part, one. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, we don't have to read part two just yet. I mean, you could, but part one, we are gonna start with an initial. Now, zero is kind of dark in there. And so I'm gonna give myself a positive angular velocity initially. You don't want to go too high. Maybe I guess we should have picked middle. I'm going to pick middle. Maybe the next one is less, right? So kind of Goldilocks this first one. Now, here's where I would highly, highly recommend on the May exam, if you draw in graphs, which last year, highly graphical, please use pencil to start, okay? Or make it dark enough, okay? Because they don't have extra graph paper. And now we're gonna have a small, doesn't mean negative, angular acceleration. Well, let's see. What direction is the angular acceleration? Go back to the picture. So we give it a clockwise push. 
And overall, isn't the tension that pulls on the side gonna also have a net torque in the clockwise direction? So we start out moving counterclockwise, we're gonna release or receive, release, we're gonna receive a clockwise additional torque. And so what's gonna happen to that angular acceleration? Is it gonna be in the clockwise or counterclockwise direction? It's gonna be in the clockwise, which is positive. So how do I represent a positive angular acceleration on an angular speed graph? So it's gonna become more positive. So maybe sometime later, they don't tell us, you know, they don't designate any part of the time, but sometime later, I'm gonna have a greater value, not necessarily twice, we don't know that, but I'm gonna have a final bigger value of angular speed. How do I connect those two dots? Curve? What would a curve mean about the angular acceleration? It would mean you have an increase in angular acceleration. Is that going to be true? Remember, this is just an initial push, okay? Gives the wheel an initial push. We're not constantly pushing, okay? And so we just get it moving. And then who's driving once we let go? Who's torquing after we let go? That tension driven by the hanging mass, right? So there's no changes in the hanging mass, the weight of the hanging mass. And so T capital R, it's gonna be a constant torque due to the hanging mass. And so it's gotta be a constant angular acceleration. And so we don't wanna curve our speed, we want to diagonal. Because remember the slope of an angular speed time graph is, or velocity is angular acceleration. Just like our kinematic graphs, but with angular terms. So how can I show that a constant positive angular acceleration on an angular acceleration graph? Straight horizontal line, right? Above or below zero? Above. And I'm gonna Goldilocks it because I don't know uh, what the next one's gonna be just yet. By the way, they said label both of these one. Now, do you get colors on the AP test? I mean, technically blue and black, but I would follow their rules, okay? Follow their rules, it's their game. All right, case two. The student places the beads closer to the center. And so what's gonna happen when I take this and move them close to the center? Smaller inertia, so smaller inertia, but again, they're not changing the hanging mass. They're not changing the radius of the wheel. So it's gonna have a constant net torque, but smaller inertia means what about its acceleration? Greater. And so now we're gonna have a bigger angular acceleration. Now for the direction, it's based on that hanging mass. We're still gonna have a positive angular acceleration because the hanging mass didn't change sides. But we do initially give now a counterclockwise push. Counterclockwise would be what direction? Negative angular initial speed. And so on the angular speed graph, maybe we start negative. But we're still gonna positively, positively accelerate and so once you stop spinning counterclockwise and begin turning clockwise, and so at some point we come through zero and then maybe we end up at the positive side. And again, straight line because we want a constant angular acceleration. Did I not go over? I need to fix that. Hold on, I don't like that line. I didn't go over enough boxes. Again, pencil on the May exam.
If you see something you don't like, okay, like that one didn't really look like a straight line to me. And so the slope is still a positive angular acceleration. Now notice it's got a steeper, and we already decided it was going to be greater. So how am I going to show that acceleration on the acceleration graph? Higher. Hopefully you left room. So here, if you you know went to the max on the first one and you want to go higher, do a little erasing, right? And so at a greater magnitude, and label those with twos, just like they said. Okay, so we just have, a, you know, eight-ish whatever minutes. I would recommend you can go try that one in the packet. I mean, you have a lot of pages. Just don't worry about tip and slip or rolling for the uh, R exam. We'll come back to the rolling. And so on NIMSY, if you go to page 23, the closing type of bell ringer or, you know, before the bell questions, try the questions one and two on page 23. If you're speedy quick, Try two more. There's actually six multiple choice in each NIMSY set. All right. So try these, and before you leave, I'll reveal the answers.